Yeah, I'm, I'm Kevin McKenzie, born and raised Regina, Saskatchewan. Getting to this point um, was a huge process. It was, it's basically a three-year research creation project um, through my MFA program um, as part of the um, Faculty of Graduate Studies and Research at the University of Regina. That all began in 2018. Uh, a lot of um, process, a lot of research, and a lot of transition has happened between the time I started and to, up to this point. Yeah, there was, it was um, a long process to get here. In my research, I was um, working with ba uh, Barbara Blind, and we were um, making traditional drums and rattles out of uh, elk rawhide and uh, going through the whole traditional process. So um, Elder Blind um, went through everything that we, all the protocols that, that, that would be necessary um, to work with this, this type of um, animal a hide. So there was ceremonies at the beginning to honor the animal and then ceremonies at the end. Um, but when I was working with the rawhide, I, I realized um, it reminded me of, of a, a high-tech material. And it reminded me like of, of a composite, like a, like a plastic or a, or a um, carbon fiber material. And I asked Barb about that. I said, I said hey, this, this rawhide really reminds me of this high-tech material, uh, you know, the carbon fiber and all that. And she said, no, she goes, that's, she goes, this is the, the high-tech material. And so once, once Barb said that, I was like, okay, I, I put two and two together and I said, okay, if that's the high-tech material, then I'm gonna use that as, as the high-tech material. And so um, what I would normally do in my research module, um, when I'm constructing a piece like, like this, where I would try to sort of indigenize an object, I would actually use the object and use all the plastic components and, and try to go through a process of, of um, um, adding um, indigenous cultural identifiers to make it um, have sort of an aesthetic that's indigenous. But the way that this was constructed was completely different because I, I deconstructed the entire object and the gear and then uh, got all the plastic components together and then molded the elk rawhide around those plastic components. And then once I had the, the components together, um, the elk rawhide components, um, then I went through a process of, of sealing the, the elk rawhide with um, um, a synthetic compound so that it would retain that shape. And, um, and then I reassembled the, the entire piece out of the elk rawhide uh, components. So um, what I've done is basically, it's a simulation of the actual piece because the actual piece is, is completely destroyed and gone. And the, the only thing that exists is the indigenous piece now. So for me, that was a huge leap forward in my research and, Barb, and Elder Barb Blind was a huge, huge um, part of, of, of that complete change in the way of my approach to, to my research. So um, it, was, it was great working with, with, with uh, uh, Barb Blind as well. So I said that's kind of the beginning of this entire exhibition was this piece. One of the, one of the other things that um, was really difficult when I um, began this process of my MFA research was I basically, I erased everything that I did from the past. In other words, I started from, from zero. And, and I, I did that intentionally because I, I, I didn't want any of that archive from the past to bleed into the, the work that I'm doing now. And, and so it was really tough to, to, to reinvent yourself, but it was part, part of this transition and transformation that I wanted to go through anyway at the same time, while, while I was going through the, the MFA program. 
I was having a lot of problems at the beginning trying to connect research and trying to connect with my culture, trying to externally express that in, in, in the research and the, the, the creation. Um, until we, we came to uh, a significant um, crossroads in my research, and this is with working with uh, Professor Garneau, and um, he has a way of, of, um, of, of doing his, his uh, critiques in, when we work individually, and uh, they're really intense, and, and so we, he's trying to get investigate uh, what uh, what the process was to, to get to the point we were at. And at one point, we were talking about something I was working on, these tie pieces, uh, the men's necktie, and, um, and I, he said, well, what, what did you do to get to this point? And I said, well, well, first of all, I had to watch this video to, to uh, learn how to tie a necktie to get a Windsor knot tied properly. And then he was thinking, okay, well, why did you have to do that? And then, and then I thought about it, and I thought, well, I guess the, the time when, when I should have been taught that was around 16 or 17, and my dad would have taught me that. But my dad passed away when I was 17 years old. And, and that, that, that sort of hit me like, a, like a, an emotional avalanche. And after that critique, uh, uh, David left the studio, and then I, I sat in the studio and I was like, what just happened? And uh, basically it was um, all those things that um, were I kind of identified with my father um, from the, the late 70s. And then so the time he died was basically, that was my identity and that was my connection to my cultural roots, because when we were growing up, my dad would always take us to Treaty 4, uh, lands and, 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 and fish, and teach us how to shoot a gun, and, and do all these tra traditional things, and, and connect with our indigenous community. Uh, my dad had a lot of friends in, in the Brett and Sandy Buffalo, Cowess, uh, Gordon's First Nations. Um, so when we were kids, he, we would traverse the land and visit all, all of his, his cousins. And he was from Le Brett, and he's actually a survivor of the Le Brett, uh residential school. But while we were doing this uh, traversing land when I was a kid, we would follow this indigenous hockey team. Um, uh, it was called uh, the Native Metal Hockey Team, which was uh, um, Native Metal was a subsidiary of uh, IPSCO at the time. And so this, I started investigating all that. And, and that was all connected to, to my, my identity and my culture. But when my dad suddenly passed away back in, in the late 70s, it, um, a lot of those, those, those connections were severed. So when I started conducting the research that, that was connected to my father, um, that's where this whole um, exhibition started to, to form and, 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 and form a framework because um, basically what I wanted to do was, was connect back to those memories um, and, and connect back with my, my cultural identity and, and connect back, um, like sort of back in time. And then, so the, the hockey theme is, is from my father's passion for indigenous hockey back in the late 70s. And so that's where this whole theme comes from. But um, at the same time, for this entire exhibition, um, it's called 17. So 17 is a really significant date for me because it, it, it was a lot of, there's a lot of trauma uh, associated with that date, because, or that year, because it's the year of, that's how old I was when I lost my father. Um, so the, um, the exhibition, is a portal, uh, the thesis exhibition is a portal that connects those memories and collects those memories and preserves those memories of my father and his teachings. Um, at the same time, I was doing research um, into Cree war shirts and because um, there was a connection between warrior culture 
and hockey, and uh, even with contemporary hockey teams, a lot of a lot of these contemporary teams, they'll call themselves the Warriors. I don't know how many teams call themselves Warriors, but there's there's a lot of of, of that of that uh, within the culture itself, the hockey culture. So there was a connection between hockey culture and warrior culture, and I was doing um, research. Uh, regarding the um, the Cree war shirt. And I found this war shirt um, in the uh, Isaac Crowley collection. It was from the 1890s. And um, I, I really gravitated towards it right away as, as soon as I saw it. And so part of my research module as well is it, is it uh, identifies signs that indigenous um, makers have done throughout time. And if you can connect with some of these signifiers, then they travel across time too. And so they don't die or they, or they don't fade away. They can be reinterpreted. And so what's happened with, with this uh, um, um, research project here is that the, uh, the Cree war shirt that I, was, that I was researching had this motif of, of um, um, tadpole. And so I thought, well, that's, that's a really interesting motif. And it was really ultra modern looking. And I thought that would be the perfect motif for me because of my, the way that I've transformed, like the tadpole itself is a creature that goes through a transformation. And so I adopted that, the tadpole, into my uh, rendition of or simulation of the war shirt. So this is a war shirt and a, um, a hockey jersey, all in one. And so, the, um, like I was saying before, um, the, ex the, the thesis exhibition is actually a portal that connects different time periods. So it's connecting to the, the 1890s, to the, 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 to the Cree war shirt that I was researching. So that's part of um, the signs within the object itself, um, and so um, it connects, the research connects to that, the 1890s, the 1970s with my father, and then my current state of uh, knowing and doing uh, indigenous um, practices. The works on the plinths are um, separate from, from this piece here, which is um, uh, a circle of 17 objects and it's a 17-foot circle. So everything references 17. 17 is repeated a lot in the exhibition. Also, the, the, um, the tadpole motif, motif is repeated. So the, the tadpole motif is, all, is on the, the war shirt, the leggings, and I wanted to trans, or, or transfer that, um, um, the motif into the, um, the circle that I created with the 17 objects. So the 17 objects do um, uh, symbolize the, the tadpole. And so this, the, the circle would be a, a healing circle or the circle of life or what I would call um, a river of tadpoles. And so it's alive. Um, and it's, it's part of a, a cyclical journey and it's, it's part of my journey as well. So um, it's really a significant part of the, um, the installation. The thing that um, was really tough and extremely emotional uh, was connecting with my father. Basically what happened was um, my, my father was a survivor of residential, residential school in Le Bret. Um, he went through a lot of intergenerational trauma, as, as did I, by losing him. Um, unfortunately, he didn't survive all this intergenerational trauma. So the uh, going back and uh, um, researching this was was extremely hard. A lot, of, a lot of tears and a lot of blood, sweat, and tears went into this exhibition. So I'm very emotionally uh, invested in this exhibition, very much so, more, more than any other body of work in my 30-year art practice. Um, and thus, I think this is probably the most powerful work that, I, that I've created. And, and 
but there's, all, there's, there's, you know, dealing with all this intergenerational trauma um, is, was, was tough, but, but at the same time, there, there is resolve. So in this exhibition, the things are resolved. Like, I, I do get back to my, to my cultural roots. I can express my, my culture and my identity through my work. In fact, a lot of these pieces, when I'm actually performing the actions, and, and uh, uh, Kathy Mattis was, was explaining this to me when I'm doing the bead work, and this bead work as well, when you're performing these actions and you're performing these, these traditional um, art forms, you're connecting with, with the ancients as well. So I, I really thought that was, that was totally where I wanted to be, is connect you know, back to, to, to those art forms and the culture in pieces like this. So as I was actually uh, constructing and going through the actions, I was actually constructing my identity at the same time. And so that's where everything was so invested in, in, in the work because my identity is, is right, is, is in every stitch and every piece of, of this entire exhibition. And everything is hand-stitched and handcrafted uh, the, the traditional way of, of doing work. So that's where this work is, is, is so, to me, it, it, it's, it's powerful. Uh, previous to, to working in the program here, I, I was basically a rogue artist, just kind of doing my own thing, and not really connected to the community, the indigenous community, and sort of interpreting things on my own and, and not really consulting with, with um, uh, knowledge keepers and, and, and going through like protocols. And so, um, in, in a sense, I was kind of appropriating my, my own culture. <laughs> and um, what's happened now is completely different because now, I, now, now I'm coming from the place where I should have been or maybe the place where I, where I am now it, it's, it's basically I am coming from my cultural roots. I'm coming from, um, um, I guess, um, being taught something and now I can actually teach that as well. So I'm coming from learning and, and experiencing. So one of the, the greatest things about um, um, my research module is, is that right at the beginning of, of this, um, um, of my MFA program, I was actually uh, part of the um, Indigenous Summer Research Institute. And so that kind of prepped me for a lot of the uh, MFA work. I didn't know it at the time, but it kind of like halfway through, I kind of figured it out. And uh, indigenous research methodologies are, rely on um, um, indigenous ways of transmitting knowledge outside of the Western canon of academia. And so I think one of the things that I've been resisting through this whole process is uh, while de or de or decolonizing, I'm trying to decolonize, I'm trying to resist this whole assimilation in, into Western and colonial culture. So I've, I've actually went through that transformation and it's, and it's actually uh, a work in, a, in progress right now. And then uh, we're doing the, working with the indigenous research methodologies, like working with Kathy Mattis and, and um, Elder Blind, and, and getting research directly and knowledge from, from them, um, yeah, is, is, is a bit of a um, resistance against the, the Western, uh, I guess, form of, of, ac of academic knowledge. So I'm not using that, I'm using the indigenous forms. So in that way, it's resisting as well. I, I was very naive when I entered this program I had no idea what, what I was up against. Um, I kind of thought if, if, well, if you have, you know, kind of a background in art, that it might help somehow. And, but, but when you start from ground zero, it, it's a constant battle. And, and then not referencing anything I've ever did in the past was, wasn't, I don't think they, they would have helped anyway, um, going through the program. Um, but the transitions were unexpected. The transitions were, uh, and transformations were unexpected. 
um, just the um, amount of um, research that goes that's involved uh, in the program was it was absolutely amazing. Um, I didn't know, like I said, I didn't know what I was getting myself into at, at the beginning. I know what it is now. It, it was a, it was a lot of hard work, but it's, it's brought me to a place where I can I can um, I can be confident in 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 handling traditional materials, in in uh, working in traditional art forms. Now I, now I have a lot of confidence in that, and and that's where I wanted to be. Um, maybe years ago, and I was never there. Um, so this program has really um, uh, propelled me in, into that um, sphere of knowledge that I was looking for, and it was the indigenous sphere of knowledge. Um, so that's going to be an ongoing um, work in progress. But um, this exhibition itself is... Um, was a lot of hard work. Um, went through a lot of um, a lot of emotion, a lot of emotional investment. But like I said, you know, like the, I, I've dealt with a lot of trauma, but that trauma has not been resolved through this process. So for me, it, it, it's it's kind of a an interesting story, and and there's a lot of irony in the work. There's a lot of irony in in the narrative. I, I say that this, I embarked on the journey of a lifetime that should have been embarked on a, lo a lifetime ago. <laughs> so, things like that. For me, th this, this is, um, it was kind of uh, ground zero at the beginning, and, and it's, it's kind of moved on past that, that ground zero point. But it, it's also uh, a launching uh, pad or a launching uh, platform where this is where um, I would say is it, I'm just at the beginning stage of, of maybe a new resurgence in, in my work. And I, I, I don't regret not taking my MFA you know, back you know, when I was younger. Uh, a lot of people take it when they're, when they're fresh out of undergrad school and, and then they continue on with that. I've got you know, a lot of years in between and um, I, I think that this was probably the best path for me to take at this point in my career because it's revitalized everything that I'm doing. And I have a different perspective on, on everything I'm doing as well um, and a different approach. So for me, this whole program has been amazing. And, and um, like I said, it was a really painful process. But at the same time, there's a lot of resolve and, and, I can, and I can move forward. As far as um, how I would um, um, advise or um, mentor or, 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 or talk to young artists, it, I, I, I'm teaching full-time at Brandon University right now, and I'll probably be there for a number of years, so I don't see myself leaving um, that university. Um, that being said, um, I, I teach like two or three um, classes each semester. I have new students all the time. So I, I enjoy the teaching process now. I didn't think that, ever, that I would ever be a, a, a university instructor. But through this whole process, it, it kind of led me in that direction. And, and so now I really appreciate that. And so uh, that's where I can use the 25 plus years that, are, that I have behind me in, in, as, a, as an art practice, I can use that um, with my students. And, and now the, my, my whole traditional um, uh, outlook on, on work, that's transformed me and, and trans, transformed my approach. Um, so I, I, I don't know exactly how that's going to um, affect my teaching, but I'm sure it's going to it, you know, at some point. The one, uh, the one great thing about uh, indigenous knowledge is, is it's, it's really, it, it's cyclical. It goes in circles. So the, when I, when I get some, when I learn something from, from an elder, such as uh, elder blind, I teach it directly to my students. So it goes from me, from elder, from the knowledge keeper to me, to my students. 
So that process is uh, continuous. And I enjoy that process.